Okay, friends, for the past 30 years, Grace Church has existed to connect people to God, His church, and His world. That's been our mission statement for the last 30 years. It's all about connection, connecting people to God, His church, and His world. God created you for relationship. He came to this earth to redeem you, to get you back into relationship, and then He has called us into relationship with those around us in the body of Christ and the world. The mission of God uh, is you and I as a church, both individually and together, uh, to love God, to love each other, and as a result, to make disciples, followers of Jesus, helping others to follow Jesus. Disciples making disciples. The equation could look like this. Love God plus loving others will result in followers of Jesus, disciples. What is the church? Well, two weeks ago, we looked at the words of Jesus who said, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. Everybody say rock. Rock. Those who follow Jesus build their lives on the foundation of the word of God, the son of God, the revelation of God in Jesus, which is our rock, our foundation. Last week, Jesus, we see how Jesus took that confession of Peter, I believe that you are the Christ, the son of the living God, and with that confession, built a church on, he said this in Matthew 16, I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock, everybody say rock, rock, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He says, this church is built on a rock of who Jesus is, the Christ, the Son of God, the Savior of the world, the Lord of creation, the Lord of life. It's all about Jesus as the rock. And then we move into the teachings of the apostles, and Paul writes to the church about the mission of the church uh, in Ephesians about following Jesus. And he follows through with this rock analogy uh, where he's talking about individual believers being united together, coming together in the church. And he says this to us, Ephesians 2.20, built on the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Christ Jesus himself being the cornerstone. What's the cornerstone? Well, it's a rock. It's a rock. Everybody say rock. Rock. The, apostle, uh, the, the, the apostles and prophets laying the foundation, which is the revelation of the word of God. He, he's referring to the teachings of Christ, Jesus Christ being that rock, being that cornerstone. So we have this analogy of the rock or a stone flowing all through the New Testament referring to Jesus. But friends, this is not just a New Testament analogy. This is an Old Testament prophecy fulfilled. Isaiah is the first to introduce the image. In the middle of his pronouncement of judgment toward the people of Israel, uh, he does not leave them without hope. This gracious, merciful God, in the midst of our rebellion and rejection of him, makes this promise to us, Isaiah 28, 16. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, Behold, I lay in Zion a stone, a rock, for a foundation, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. Whoever believes will not act hastily, and that word is referring to panic or fear or anxiety. Those who rest on this rock need not live in fear. Fast forward 700 years, and Peter will quote this passage as confirmation of the person of Jesus. 1 Peter 2 6. For it stands in Scripture, referring to Isaiah, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a rock, a cornerstone, chosen and precious. And whoever believes in him will not be, and he changes the word here, will not be put to shame will not be put to shame. So the Israelites are facing physical bondage in captivity because of their sin, but then Peter is directing our thought to our spiritual bondage because of sin. This is Jesus, the tried stone, the chosen stone, the precious stone, the rock, which is a sure foundation, who takes our guilt and covers our shame. Now, we use different methods today, but the principle remains. Salva uh, foundations are everything. In the days of Jesus, in that ancient world, if you wanted to build a house or a building or a temple, you would select a large, expertly cut, which would mean a very expensive stone that you would lay at the beginning of the construction pro project to serve as the cornerstone of that foundation and construction. Every other stone was laid in succession in one direction and then perpendicularly in another direction, and they were all aligned to this one stone. So this one stone had to be right. It had to be perfect. 
If there was any flaw in this one stone, if there was one angle that was cut incorrectly, or if this angle was cut too steep, if this one stone was off kilter in any other way, uh, this, this would throw off the alignment of all of the rest of the stones and it would put the construction of this uh, building in jeopardy. <clears throat> Now, friends, you get the point and you understand the principle. The reason why Jesus is talked about as the chief cornerstone, the precious rock on which we build, because he is the creator of life. He is the Lord of life. He is the savior of life. Colossians says that he is preeminent over all things. There is no foundation upon which to build other than the rock, which is Jesus. He is the cornerstone for all things. He is the perfect stone, the precious stone, the chosen stone that will not lead you astray. You build your life on Jesus, this cornerstone, and you will not live in fear. You need not live in shame. He is the stone, the rock, that will not disappoint. We call it discipleship, or as I often use the phrase, followers of Jesus. People whose lives are aligned to, squared off, guided by, shaped by, built on the rock of Jesus. People who love God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength, and love others, love their neighbors as themselves. Why? Because Jesus is this cornerstone on which we have built our lives. And now that we have built our lives on Jesus, the purpose of this building that we have built is then to help others follow Jesus. To follow people who follow Jesus, helping others do the same. Disciples making disciples. Now, what is a disciple? Well, the Greek word is methetes, which is, a commonly t- which is the most commonly translated word in the Bible for disciple. It is found 268 times in the New Testament. And the thing is, in today's world, it is mostly a Bible term or a church word. You don't find the word disciple in our common cultural vernacular today. But the principle and the presence of discipleship is everywhere in our culture. Because the word might be better translated for us, apprentice. This is a word that we use and we understand. There are jobs and careers you cannot get without first apprenticing yourself under those who have mastered those skills that you need to acquire. So you place yourself under their teaching. You observe their skills, their lives. You adopt their methods and their strategies. In essence, you become like them by being with them and learning from them and doing what they do. Friends, that's the essence of discipleship. Being with Jesus, learning from Jesus, and doing the things that Jesus does. Now, with any apprenticeship, there is a cost. There is a price to be paid to submit yourself to that kind of leadership. You can't be a plumber or an electrician without apprenticing yourself to the professional in that profession so that you can learn that profession to become a professional. Doctors and lawyers, apprentice. Aspiring teachers, student teach with a professional to become a teacher. So in the Gospels, you find the call to apprenticeship or discipleship. Luke 9, Jesus said to all, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. Friends, a serious reading of the Gospels makes it clear that whenever Jesus uh, called someone to follow him, called them into discipleship, he never hid the fine print. He never concealed the conditions. He never compromised or watered down the requirements. Look again at this. If anyone would come after me, follow me, become my disciple, let him deny yourself. To deny yourself is to say no to yourself, Which, which is to say you cannot follow Jesus without saying no to yourself. To follow Jesus entails points, entails points of tension between what you want and the direction you want to go and what Jesus wants for you in the direction he's leading you. Service over selfishness. Generosity over greed. Purity over pleasure. Forgiveness over bitterness. All of these decisions, in order to say yes to Jesus, means you have to say no to yourself. Jesus says, if anyone would come after me, let him, secondly, take up his cross daily. Now, everybody within the, within the sound of his voice knew exactly what Jesus was saying here. Roman crucifixions were commonplace in that day. It meant death. Following Jesus meant death to you. Every time you deny yourself is a death to yourself. And so Jesus says, if you're going to follow me, if you're going to apprentice under me, you're going to have to die to everything in your life, everything that you have, everything that you are. Because if you're not ready to die for me, you are not ready to live for me. 
If anyone would come after me, he says, let him then follow me. Here's the deal, friends. You read the Gospels and you consider the encounters Jesus had with would-be disciples. And here's what's interesting uh, uh, about the encounters that Jesus had with would-be followers. He never, he never called them into salvation. Jesus never, you read, he never invited anybody to be saved. Now, he talked about salvation for sure, but he never invited people to be saved. He was always calling them into discipleship, into actually following him. Now, many of you can remember, if you're a Christian today, many of you can, can remember when you became a Christian. I mean, you can name the time and the place, who was involved, how the conversation went, how you felt about that. You can remember the moment you crossed the line of faith, that you would become a Christian. For many of you, it was an emotional moment. It was a memorable moment. You'll never forget it. But friends, you need to understand that for, for Jesus, for Jesus, salvation was not a moment. It was a doorway into a movement. It wasn't just finding Jesus. It was actually following Jesus. Jesus never separated the two. Now, for, for a point of clarification, do you need, do you need to believe in Jesus? <laughs> yes. Do you need to accept Jesus as your Savior, confess him as Lord? Yes. Do you need to repent of your sins? Do you need to be baptized into Christ? All of those elements can happen in a moment. But that moment simply instigates a movement. It never stops at the moment. Every direction in your life begins with a decision in life. So there is a decision in the moment, but the moment is just a, a movement at that starting point. So what, so what is that direction? Let me give you three things that characterize a follower of Jesus. Number one, a follower of Jesus grows in their knowledge of Jesus. A disciple grows in the knowledge of Jesus. They never stop growing. Growth is a movement word. I have grandchildren. Have I ever mentioned that to you people? Okay. I mean, and especially as a grandfather, I, I, is there anything more captivating than watching a child, your child, your grandchild, shooting up physically? And it just goes so fast. Developing emotional maturity, learning things, learning how to read, learning how to write, learning, learning all of those things, coming into their own person, the way God created them and wired them to, to see the self-discovery, just, just to watch them grow and develop. It is a glory to watch. And it is a grave concern when that process is interrupted or if there's, a, if there's a glitch in their development, it is a natural thing to grow and we are all concerned when that growth isn't happening. Friends, following Jesus is a movement, not a moment. It is not a theological conviction. It is a lifetime commitment. It's not a religious position. It is a relational posture with the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Take marriage, for instance. Take my marriage, for example. 46 years ago, I stood at the front of the church in full view of all those who had come to witness my renouncement of the old life and my commitment to the new life. I renounced all other loves, and I professed my loyalty and faithfulness to my bride. I repeated what the pastor told me to say, and I signed a document legalizing the arrangement in that moment. And in that moment, I became a husband. I took on the designation. In that moment, 46 years ago, I was termed a husband. 46 years ago, I took on that title. But to be honest, I had no clue in that moment what I was getting myself into. 46 years into it, well, I think I'm making progress, but you'd have to ask my wife. I mean, my poor wife. I mean, she got, she got the engagement ring, she got the wedding ring, and for 46 years, she's, been, she's gotten the suffering. Uh, <laughs> what's my point? You, you just grow into it. You, grow in, you, you just never stop growing into it. I say here all the time at Grace Church, it doesn't matter. Every one of us is on a journey. It doesn't matter where you are on that journey. Don't, don't, be, don't feel guilty or whatever. You're, you're at a point. The point is moving on that journey. The point is taking the next step in that journey. 
The New Testament writings are all about taking the next step. It's all about movement. The Apostle Paul was always praying for the growth of the church, for growth of believers. He says in Colossians 1, And so from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, increasing, growing in the knowledge of God. Disciple, 268 times in the Gospels. It is the term that Jesus used to identify those who believed in him, those who followed him, as opposed uh, to the term Christian, which is most commonly used in our American culture. We call ourselves Christians, not necessarily followers. What's interesting uh, is that this term Christian, uh, you will find it in the New Testament, but you will only find it three times. And every time you find it, Jesus never used the term. The apostles never used the term. The church never used the term. It was always used by a person who did not follow Jesus to, uh, as a derogatory term to those who did. In the New Testament, it was always a negative connotation to the term Christian. Now, what's my point? Here's my point, friends. Unfortunately, in our culture, we have created a world where you can be a Christian but not a follower. Jesus would not have made that distinction. According to a Gallup poll, as many as 75% of Americans still self-identify as Christian, which seems really, really odd to me. I mean, you just think about this. If 75% of us truly follow Jesus, do you really think we'd be in the cultural mess in which we find ourselves, really? (laughs) So there's got to be a disconnect in terminology. There's got to be a disconnect in what it means to follow Jesus. And we have a term for that, friends. It's called cultural Christianity. One of the greatest challenges of American Christianity is the the intense individualism and the consumerism in which that dominates our culture and infiltrates our faith and our walk with Jesus. In every waking moment of our world, we're we're taught to think of ourselves and pursue what we want. I talk about this as much as I can because we're just so often blind to this and easily deceived by it. But think about this, friends. This is not just, this this is just one example. Most of us would acknowledge the fact that God, God in heaven is good to us, right? God is good, and God is good to us. But have you ever considered the fact that God is good for us? He's not just good to you. He is good for you. Jesus' invitation into his life is not a goodness directed to you. It is a, direct, it is a goodness designed for you. Cultural Christianity focuses on the God who is good to us. But following Jesus, this true discipleship focuses on the God who is good for us, that Jesus is good for us. An example, Psalm 16, 11, you make known to me the path of life. In your presence, there is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. The common American Christian reads that verse. And which, which word is, comes out at the top for us? You've got three words, path, presence, and pleasure. But in cultural Christianity, which word comes to the top? Most of us would say pleasure. God is good to us. But, they, but you have to ask the question, how do you get to that goodness? How do you experience that goodness? What does goodness really mean? And the writer says, you've got to follow the path. You've got to dwell in the presence. The message of cultural Christianity is to seek God's goodies. But the message of discipleship is to seek God's goodness. The message of cultural Christianity is to keep your nose clean and God will compensate you. But friends, the message of discipleship is that my only hope is in the good news of Jesus Christ, the gospel. Every day I remind myself of my utter and complete dependence on the grace of God. The message of cultural Christianity is, you know, just check off all the religious boxes so God will owe you. Friends, discipleship is to understand that Jesus paid it all. All to him I owe. There is no bargaining, no negotiation. Cultural Christianity is believe the right things, show up at church a respectable number of times, and be a semi-moral person so you can get on the right side of God. It's like... It's less like Jesus following, it's, it's less like following Jesus and more like Jesus following you. But friends, when I follow the path, when I dwell in the presence, the pleasures of God take on a whole new experience, a whole new meaning. It's a whole new life. He makes known to me the path of life in his presence. 
his fullness of joy. At his right hand, in relationship with him, our pleasures forevermore. Paul prayed that we experience the goodness of God as we deepen our knowledge of God. What is discipleship? It's knowing Jesus, a constant, consistent hunger in pursuit of Jesus. This is what disciples do. They grow in their knowledge of Jesus. Secondly, they live for the glory of Jesus. The glory of Jesus. This is exactly what a disciple does. They emulate the life of the one they follow to their honor and praise. We become like Jesus as an act of worship to Jesus. We reflect the life of Jesus as an act as an act of honoring Jesus. Now, here's the deal, friends. Everyone in this room is a disciple. We are all disciples. Everyone is being formed or shaped by something or someone. You are not the owner of your life. You are not the creator of your life. We all have sources of influence that is making us into the person that we are becoming. You are not a static human being. You are moving toward a destination in a particular direction. The question is, who or what is forming you? Are you a disciple of Jesus or are you a disciple of the world? Are you a disciple of Jesus doing what Jesus did, counting the cost and paying the price, or are you a disciple of money or power or pleasure, a disciple of people's approval, whatever it is that you're giving your life to and being shaped by it? How would you know? Well, let me just offer two diagnostic tools that might help you understand who is actually shaping you and forming you. Check your calendar and check your bank account. Okay, Jesus calls for everything. And so when you examine what you give your time to, what you spend your money on, that might indicate to you who you are following and what you're being shaped by. What happens when your, your, your life falls apart? What happens when everything goes wrong? Do you run to Jesus or complain and walk away from Jesus? What do you run to? What do you rely on? Friends, I am a disciple of Jesus. I want to grow and mature and become like Jesus. I want to honor Jesus with my life, with everything that I do and everything that I say. I want to live in the, I want to follow the path and dwell in the presence and experience his pleasures forevermore. And I, want, I don't want to make too many assumptions here, but I don't think you'd be in this room if you didn't at some level or some degree want the same, right? But how do you get there? We find the teachings of Jesus compelling. But you will also find the teaching of Jesus so very hard and difficult to follow through on. You find the life of Jesus compelling, but you will find the life of Jesus so incredibly difficult to live out. We call it the Sermon on the Mount. It is the most comprehensive teaching of Jesus about the life of Jesus. Jesus said that I have come to give you life that you might have abundant life or life to the full, the life that brings pleasures forevermore, life in the kingdom under the rule of Jesus. Jesus is teaching us in the Sermon on the Mount how to live the abundant life and doing so emulating the Jesus life. We don't have time to read the Sermon on the Mount. Many of you are familiar with it anyway, but when you read it, when you read the Sermon on the Mount, you come away with this first conclusion, I can't do that. <laughs> I, can't, I can't do that. But you read the Sermon on the Mount and you come away with a second conclusion, I wish I could do that. What would my life be like if I would actually do that? If I actually follow Jesus into life, loving my enemy, turn, actually turning the other cheek, going the second mile, what would my life be like if I actually followed Jesus? What would it feel like? Think about this. How, how could I feel? How would I feel if it was impossible for those who offended me to offend me? Do, you think about, do I need to say that again? What would your life be like if those who hurt you could not hurt you? In other words, regardless of what the world does to you or gives you, what other people do to you, regardless of their behavior toward you, they could not steal your peace. They could not rob you of your joy. They could not diminish the life of Jesus in you. Friends, this is what Jesus is calling us to. We, call, we, we use the term second nature. What if the life of Jesus was so much a part of me that loving those who didn't love me back, well, I just, I just don't think about it. I, I just do it. I couldn't imagine not doing it. Like, like not forgiving someone was so foreign to me 
that I look, I look at the, ra- the world around me and all of its anger and bitterness and vitriol and revenge and the biting and devouring of one another, and, and I think to myself, <laughs> why would anyone want to live like that? What if forgiving somebody didn't require me to go to counseling? <laughs> I just live the life of Jesus. Those who follow Jesus become like Jesus. Not perfectly, but pro- progressively. Friends, this is a movement through the power of the Holy Spirit, dwelling in the presence of God, walking the path of Jesus, becoming his follower, renewing your mind and reordering your heart and redirecting your life. And in, that, in so doing, we live for his glory. When you read the Gospels, friends, you find two major groups that Jesus encountered, the crowds and the disciples. Jesus had crowds who were amazed at his teachings, but then he had disciples who actually followed those teachings. And you read the Gospels, and it's not our place. You look at the crowds and the disciples, and it's not our purpose uh, to judge who's in and who's out, but it does beg the question for all of us, am I just a face in the crowd, or am I actually a follower of Jesus? Followers of Jesus grow in the knowledge of Jesus, and they live for the glory of Jesus, which leads us to point number three, we share the message of Jesus. The message of Jesus, what is the gospel, friends? What is the good news of the kingdom? It is God doing for us what we could not do for ourselves. It is a God who created us, redeeming us, rescuing us from our brokenness, covering our rebellion, saving us from ourselves. Friends, this is our highest calling. This is our greatest challenge. All four of the Gospels, all, all four of the Gospel writers in their, their writings with this call of Jesus to share his message to the world, to make disciples. Matthew 28, 19, we just read it. Go, therefore, and make disciples. Mark 16, 15, go into all the world and proclaim the Gospel. Luke says in Acts chapter 1, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and the ends of the earth. And then John records the words of Jesus, as the Father has sent me, so send I you. Friends, we live in a lost world who doesn't understand that they're lost, but they do know that something's wrong. And they're looking for all the answers in all the wrong places, trying to fix a problem that they can't even diagnose. But there is something deep inside of us that tells us something is bent, something is out of shape, something is off kilter. There's something in this construction of a life that has thrown everything off. Something is not right. In the words of Augustine, man has turned in on himself. We have built on the wrong foundation. We have an inadequate cornerstone. All the way from ethnic genocides to family feuds around the Thanksgiving table. Friends, it's everywhere. We need to be saved from ourselves. And not just from what happens around us because of sin, but because of what happens within us because of sin. Isaiah, the prophet, stands before the nation of Israel pronouncing judgment because of their rejection of God, predicting doom because of their sin. Why? Because we all, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. But God, but God, the most important phrase in the entire Bible, but God, Ephesians 2, you were dead in your trespasses and sins, but God, verse 5, because of his mercy, Friends, we never graduate from that. Every morning when the sun comes up, we are reminded of his mercy. We just keep going deeper and deeper, deeper into the fact that Jesus has done for us what we cannot do for ourselves. And so in following him brings us the life that we so desperately desire. And Jesus calls us to that movement, to that discipleship, to that following. That's the kind of church Grace Church has been. That's the kind of church that Grace Church continues to be to pronounce and proclaim the good news of the kingdom of God, that Jesus Christ has come to save us from ourselves and to give us the life that we want. Dallas Willard says, if your preaching of the gospel does not naturally lead people to apprentice under Jesus, actually follow him, then you're not preaching the gospel. Jesus said, repent and believe the good news, to change your mind and to change the direction of your life, to actually follow him into this new life. Life has come to life in Jesus, a heavenly way of being human in Jesus, loving God, loving others, and in so doing, helping others come to know him as their savior. Friends, if you're a believer, you must realize that you are where you are because someone before you preached the gospel to you. 
It may have been in a public church service as we are in right now. It may have been in a personal, private conversation with, an, with a Jesus follower. It may have been a pastor. It may have been a parent. It may have been a friend or a colleague. But you need to know this. You didn't get this on your own. You didn't generate this by yourself. If you are a follower of Jesus, it's because a follower of Jesus actually followed Jesus and helped you do the same. That is our calling. Every generation has unique uh, an untransferable commission to share the gospel, the good news of Jesus, within its own culture to lead the next generation into the kingdom of God. The church, I've said this before, the church is never more than one generation from extinction. So if we don't do it, it will not be done. It is up to us, you and me, followers of Jesus, helping others to follow Jesus. We want everything about Grace Church to be about Jesus. He is everything. He is the cornerstone. He is the foundation. He is the rock on which we stand. He is the rock which we preach. We want to honor Jesus, love Jesus, worship Jesus, exalt Jesus, learn from Jesus, imitate Jesus, celebrate Jesus, trust Jesus, obey Jesus, follow Jesus, share Jesus. When it comes to Grace Church, you're going to hear about Jesus. And if you don't hear about Jesus, we stop being the church. He is the cornerstone of our salvation the cornerstone of our faith, the cornerstone of our practice. It's all about Jesus, the cornerstone that can be trusted. He is the chosen, precious cornerstone. It's all about Jesus. This is our heritage, and this is our legacy, a church rooted in the gospel, standing on the rock of our salvation, stable and steadfast for the next generation, preaching the grace of God. That's the kind of church I want to be a part of. That's the kind of church my child, I want my children to be raised in. That's the kind of church that I want to influence my grandchildren. Not a perfect church. In fact, quite a messy church. If it wasn't, if it wasn't a messy church, it wouldn't be a church. <laughs> because we lean on and stand on and dwell in and share the grace of God, the words of Jesus, the life of Jesus, the love of Jesus, stri- just striving to be Jesus to each other and to the world around us. If you're not a follower of Jesus, you can start in this moment to acknowledge your brokenness and accept his forgiveness and decide that that in this moment that you will join the movement to be Jesus in this world. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you that those before us took the commission seriously, that they loved God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. They loved those around them and in so doing, shared the gospel with those who would hear and respond. And we take on that calling as well, Father, that challenge, that commission to leave that legacy of grace and salvation to those behind us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.